exit. So uh, tonight we're going to be in Isaiah 8. If you uh, turn to your Bibles in Isaiah 8, we're going to be there, starting in chapter 11, going to finish off that chapter to chapter or verse 22. Uh, so while you guys are turning there, I just have a couple questions I just want you to mill around in your head, uh, think about it as we're going through the message. Uh, but, you know, do we, do we have a proper understanding of who God is? I mean, I know that's a, a lofty question, but... Uh, but as Christians, we're, we're, we're called to seek after God. We're called to seek and find him. And so do we have a, a good understanding of who he is? What things do we have or, or what things are we doing in our life that either demonstrate our understanding of who he is or the lack thereof? You know, are we, do we have things in our life that we know God wouldn't be happy with? Are we doing things that he has called us to do and, and we're taking that full force into the world. You know, it's, it's been said that uh, if you can believe the first line of the Bible that the rest of it is easy. The, the first line of the Bible is, uh, in the beginning, God created. If you can believe that, everything else is believable. The burning bush, the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, but if that statement is true, what do our actions show on that? Do we hold that God, that God, do we hold that God in a type of reverence? You know, the kind of reverence that brings us to our knees and, and creates that statement that Isaiah says that, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know, it's, it's quite the undertaking to try to understand God. We have, to, we have to learn who he is. We have to understand his character and, and his attributes. But I just want you guys to realize that, that one night, one year, one lifetime is, is never going to be enough to find out who God is. But that search, that journey, that's our, priv that's our privilege. That's our pleasure to seek after God. In Solomon, uh, in Proverbs, Solomon said in uh, Proverbs 1, verse 7, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. And so we fear him, we understand him, we, we get to know him, and he gives us the understanding of this world. He gives us the understanding of the things of above. And so we're going to get into this uh, chapter, chapter 8 is, again. Isaiah chapter 8, but uh, before we get in, let's uh, open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this time where we can get together and, and chew on your word, Lord. To seek after you, to understand, to, to grow and, and learn in the things that you want us to know. You've revealed yourself throughout history. You've revealed yourself to your children, Lord. But to us, you have revealed yourself completely in, in your word. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your word that, that we can know you, we can study you, that we can grow. And so we ask that you speak to us tonight. Translate your word. Help us to understand you and, and who you are and what you're calling of us. And so we lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, just uh, for some historical context, um, Isaiah chapter 8 is uh, during a time when Israel is, is a divided kingdom at this point. We've got uh, the kingdom of Israel, which is in the north, and then we've got the kingdom of Judah, which is in the south. And in our reading tonight, um, at this time, the king of Judah in the south, his name was King Ahaz. Now, Ahaz, he was not a good king at all. You know, in fact, we read in Second Kings and we read in Second Chronicles um, about his reign. You know, it, it gives us how long he, he reigned, but ultimately it says he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. Some of the things that he, he had done, his, they said that he passed his children through the fire. He sacrificed his children to the gods of the Canaanites where they were. He sacrificed on the high places. And these were places that, that were designed for pagan worship, completely against what God had wanted. 
he would even take the treasures out of the temple. He would divide them and give them to other kingdoms, other kings for alliances and, and favors. In Second Chronicles uh, chapter 28, uh, it says that King Ahaz, he provoked the anger, uh, he provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. I mean, God's forgiving, God's long-suffering, and so to provoke God to anger is is quite a feat, not a feat that I want you guys to try to shoot for, but a feat nonetheless. But tonight, um, in the place where we're at, we've got King Ahaz, but we also have the king of Israel, which again is in the northern kingdom, and the king of Syria. They had made, made an alliance together. They had come together to go up against Jerusalem, to go up against King Ahaz. They wanted to remove Ahaz as king and place in his in his stead somebody of their choosing somebody they can control somebody they could they knew was going to pass out edicts aligned with what they wanted now i want you guys to think about that and kind of place yourself in the city of jerusalem on one hand you know you know your king is not good your neighbor knows the king everybody knows that your king is not a good king He's knee-deep in idolatry, completely against your God. He's given away national treasures, treasures of the kingdom, to seek alliances with different countries, with other countries. Countries that, that don't share your culture and countries that don't have your values and, and don't serve your God. But on the other hand, we've got two countries that are surrounding your city. They're surrounding your country, and you know that they're going to invade. What they want to do, what they come to do, is to remove your king and put in somebody else. Now, you know that your king. You're familiar with your king. Yes, he's a bad king, but he's still your king, right? And they want to put somebody else in his place. You don't know who that person is. You don't know how they're going to act. You don't know what he's going to do. And so you got to be thinking, when this king comes in, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family, to my neighbors, to my community? Are they going to you know, uproot us? Are they going to take away my livelihood? Are they going to enslave us and take us off to a different country? Because that's pretty common during those times. Or are they just going to forego all of the hassle and just kill us right here and leave us in the dirt? So with that thought in your head, the, the, the imminent danger of these people and, and what's coming around them, I want you to keep that thought in your head as we, as we get into verse 11. But verse, uh, starting in verse 11, it, it's a message. It's a message for Isaiah, but it's also a message for God's people. It's a message for God's people during, during times of uncertainty, when, when things seem uh, just outright chaotic, when fear and dread are a constant factor and a constant deciding factor in the decisions that you end up making. Ultimately, these verses that we're going to go through, it's a message for, for you. It's a message for me, for how we're to conduct ourselves individually and also corporately as a church body. It's how we're to conduct ourselves either in our small sphere of influence at, at work or at home or how we react to the operations of places in power where we don't seem like we have any control or any uh, influence in. And so let's start in uh, verse 11. It says, For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me, that I should not walk in the way of this people. You know, God was an instructor from the start. He, he was a teacher. I mean, he, he taught Adam. He, said, he grabbed Adam. He put him in a garden. And he said, you can do anything you want here. You can have food from this tree. You can eat from this plant. Just don't eat from this tree. It was an instruction that he gave. 
And so God started as, as an instructor. He started as a teacher. That doesn't mean teaching is a blessed occupation, but we love our teachers. But, uh, you know, God is, is an instructor. And he doesn't mind teaching us. He's not afraid of our concerns. He doesn't quiver at the questions that we have for him. In the first chapter of Isaiah, God himself actually tells us, he says, come now and let us reason together. In Psalm 32, uh, God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And then Isaiah says of God in chapter 28, he says, he instructs him in right judgment, in right judgment, his God teaches him. And then later on in, in that chapter, he says, the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. We have, we have a good teacher. We have a great instructor in God. And that's our God. So, so when he instructs, when he teaches, our response should be, yes, Lord, let's listen. Let me listen to you. But here, uh, here in this instruction in, in verse 11, um, it's, it's a correction. It's more of a, a correcting instruction, and it says with a strong hand, meaning God is, is being forceful. He's forcefully co uh, correcting his people because God knows there's a sense of urgency. God knows that these people are panicking, that, that they're being encircled by foreign invaders that, that they need hope, they need encouragement right now. And so God's forcefully encouraging these people. Now as God's people, as his children, we don't get, uh, we don't get excited and we don't get upset with correction. In Proverbs 3 it says, uh, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. But why? Why shouldn't we detest it? Why shouldn't we be upset when somebody's correcting us or when God's correcting us? Further down in verse 12, it says, For him, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects. We know that God loves us. We know his correction is for our best interest. Yes, Lord. But I think that that, that love shines through actually, when God says, with a strong hand. You know, any of us who have ever had uh, discipline growing up, a strong hand was not always fun to get, but it was necessary at times. But God's saying that he, he's instructing with a strong hand, and, and God, God is sovereign. God has all authority. God has all power, and so he could do anything he wants. He could tell us, go over here. He could tell you to go over there, or don't do this, or don't do that. But that's not what he does. He's, he's guiding us with his hands. It's almost like, like a intimate father's hands who's coming down to guide us and direct us to walk us through life, to, to take us. So you think, think about God's, head, God's hands, the hands that, that took, took nothing. And what the Bible says is that he measured out the universe with the span of his hands. You think about the hands that, that molded and formed man out of the dust of the earth. Those hands, again, that guide us through this life. In Psalm 73, it says, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand, and you will guide me with your counsel. We also think of these hands that, that protect us. Jesus himself, he said in John 10, speaking of us as believers, he says, I give them eternal life that they shall never perish neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of his hand Amen. and ultimately these hands these hands of God they're the ones that 
that shielded us from the consequences of our sin. Jesus was crucified on that cross. And what was God's response to that? In Isaiah 49, God himself, he says, I will not forget you. I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. So yes, God is being forceful here. And with strong hands, with intimate, with loving hands, he's instructing us and correcting us. And we listen. We listen to God's instructions because what did we read earlier? It said, whom the Lord loves, he corrects. So if he's correcting us, what is he correcting us? What is he telling us to do? Which ways are he's, is he telling us to go in? Verse 12, it says, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that the people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Now you have to remember the state that these people were in. There is a two-country army that's surrounding them. Their king isn't a good king. People are probably speculating about what's going to happen. They're sowing panic. They're sowing fear with gossip. But that's what the world does, right? That's the world system that we live in. The world essentially threatens us. It threatens us to instill fear in us for, for many reasons, but some of them are for conformity, for obedience. But ultimately, it's to take us as Christians to take our eyes off of, off of the Lord, take our focus off of him and what he has for us. But God is saying, don't be concerned with that. Don't be concerned with what they're doing. Don't listen to the to the rumors of what's going on. Don't go along with them. Don't be afraid and don't be terrified of what is happening. I mean, what are we supposed to do then? I mean, it's not as though what we see isn't going on. It's not the, as though the things that, that are happening in this world are an illusion that we're just making up. These things are actually going on, and we see them. But Paul tells us in Romans 12, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we see the world. We understand the things, that's going, the things that they're doing, the things that are going on but we see it for what it is. We know the powers behind the decisions that are being made. We understand the principalities that are in charge of laws that are coming out. We know the powers behind the ills of this world and we're careful not to fall into conformity. We're careful not to step in line with the world by the renewing of our mind, by the understanding of Scripture, by our focus on God and prayer daily. We focus on God and the word that he's preserved for us, the callings that he's put on our lives, the ministries that he's put us in. So if we're not to follow the world's example, then, then what are we to do? God tells us in, in verse 13, he says, the Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. I want you to look at the, the title of God here. And this is a title of, of him. It says, he's the Lord of hosts. That, that Lord there, that's, that's the name of God. That's the unspeakable Yahweh in Scripture. That is what they call the self-existing one. This God who is in control of heaven's armies. 
He is the one who's telling you that you should fear him. I mean, that, that title alone should convey ultimate power and ultimate authority in this world. God is basically saying that, that if there is anything to fear, it should be me. David says in, in Psalm 24, Who is this king of glory? He says, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Again, he asked, Who is the king of glory? And it gives this title. He says, He's the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. You know, David understood as, as much as one could understand the power that God had. That God is unmatched in power. That he was not to be taken lightly. But right here there at the end, he says, who is the king of glory? And he gives his title. He says, he is the Lord of hosts. Now, David was... David was a psalmist, but he wasn't just throwing out uh, political or uh, poetic references here. He wasn't trying to boast up God with, with a mighty title. No, David understood, again, as much as one can understand God, but he understood the power of God. You know, David, as, as a young boy, he... Uh, as a young boy, uh, Israel and the Philistines were, were at war with one another. One day he goes down to uh, see his brothers in the battle and give them food, provisions, and just kind of be nosy and see what's going on. And the Philistines, they had what they called a champion. Their champion was Goliath. He was, they used to call him a warrior from birth. He was a man that uh, they calculated out to be about nine and a half feet tall. And he was there, he was provoking God, he was uh, making fun of God and God's armies. And David took exception to that. He picked up five stones with his slingshot, threw it at Goliath, killed him with one shot, ran over, cut off his head, and he won the victory. But how did David achieve such a feat? I mean, the average height for somebody about that in that times was about five feet. This guy was nine five. David was probably maybe about four feet at this time. I mean, that's that's an amazing feat. But in First Samuel, David tells Goliath as he's taunting them. He says, "You've come with, come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin." But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who, ha who you have defied. He's basically saying, you have come ill-equipped. I am, I am just a man, but you have come against the Lord of hosts. Now, David wasn't, wasn't in a state of schizophrenia. He knew what he saw. He saw this nine and a half foot man. He, he saw the power that he had, the threats, the, the fear that he put in people. All that was real. But these, are, these facts that David knew, these, these things that he saw, paled in comparison under the fact that he knew who he was serving. He knew who the Lord of hosts was. He knew what he was about to get into, and it was to be an instrument used by God to defeat this person. But why is it fear? Why should we have a fear of God? I mean, it's, he's the God of love, right? He's a God of compassion. He's a God of mercy. He is all of these things. Those are his attributes. Those are his character traits. But when we understand his character traits, when we understand his attributes, that should lead us to a place of awe, to respect and fear of the Lord. You know, we know God, he, he's the creator. In John 1, it says, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. 
all of this, all of this here, you, me, we are all here because God made us. And again, in Colossians, it says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So the fact that, that he made you, the fact that he made everything, that's one aspect of it. But the fact that we are still in one piece, that we're not broken up into molecules all throughout the universe, that is because of him. Because as it says here, all things consist in him. There is nothing made that he did not make. There's no living creature out there that does not have God's breath in their lungs. And is that, that not deserving of our respectful fear of who he is? God is sovereign. God has the freedom to do whatever he wills to do. There are things that God cannot do. God cannot lie. God cannot cheat. God cannot steal. But that he doesn't will to do those things. Those are not in his character. Those are not the things that he desires to do. But what does he desire to do? He desires to be good. He desires to be long-suffering, to be gracious, to be loving. Those are his characters. And so in his sovereignty, he has, the, again, the freedom to do anything he wills to do. He is in control. As Romans 8 says, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. In his sovereignty, he is working all things together to bring about his purposes to bring about his plans for the world. So as his children, we should be the most people at peace, knowing that our Father is sovereign and that he has absolute freedom to do what he needs to do to get things done. But when we think about fear, what comes to mind? We think about panic. We think about dread. We think about paralyzation, immobility to do anything. You know, fear is a, it's a basic human reaction. It's, it's a basic human emotion that has probably kept a lot of us alive for as long as we have been. It keeps us, most of us, from not wearing our seatbelts while we're driving. It keeps us from walking up to a bear in the woods and, and trying to pet it, right? Or, you know, veering off the freeway when you see that really nice gravelly ramp that goes right up. It keeps us from doing those kind of things. Fear keeps us safe. It, it keeps us coming home at night when we're out in the world. I mean, there's a myriad of things that could go wrong in, in our day. And those, those, that intuition, if you want to say, the, the fear, it keeps us from going into these things and brings us home. But what's the fear of God? The fear of God shouldn't keep us away, but it should propel us out into the world. To do the, the great commission that he's called, to go out and tell all the world. Knowing that, again, knowing that there's a numerable amount of things that could go wrong in our day. We have that security knowing that God loves us and that God is in control of everything. You know, A.W. Tozer, he said, while it looks like things are out of control, behind the scenes there is a God who hasn't surrendered his authority. God hasn't given up. God hasn't, as some people say, started a top and let it spin and see where it goes. He is in control. He's guiding and directing everything. 
you know, people, people have been studying fear for years. They want to know what it is. They want to know where it comes from. Ultimately, they want to know how to overcome it. You know, one thing they found that, that I think is kind of interesting is that when you voluntarily uh, face your fears, you, it, it produces inside of you, it produces bravery, it produces courage. It doesn't take away the fear, it doesn't take away the danger of what's going on, but it makes you braver to interact with it, to, to be able to go out into the world and do these things and, and with a certain level of confidence. But what does that mean for us? I mean, the only thing that we have to fear and face is God. But we do not presume to, to stand in front of God and be brave at God. But we be brave for God. You know, the powers of this world, the, the things that are in this world that, that try to instill fear in you, try to bring you down, try to make you afraid, they're, the thing they're afraid of is God. In James 2, it says, You believe that there is one God. You do well. But even the demons believe and tremble. So those things that are trying to scare you in this world, those things that are trying to put you in a place of fear, of immobility from doing what God has asked you to do, they are afraid of your God. So if they, those who have been in God's presence, who have been in his throne room, if they are afraid of God, why aren't we afraid of God? You know, um, so if, uh, if they are afraid of God, of God's presence, um, who are we not to be afraid? Sorry, uh, but the fear should keep us, shouldn't keep us away from God. We shouldn't be afraid to have access to God. The children of Israel did that. They did that in the desert when they came out of Egypt. They were paralyzed by fear. They, they were afraid of God. And, and what they told Moses, they told Moses, you go and talk to God, and then you talk to us. But don't let God talk to us. Because if God talks to us, we will die. Moses told him, you're not to have that fear of God. You're not to be afraid that he is going to kill you. You're to have fear of him. And what he said is, you have fear so that you do right. That you don't sin. That's the fear you have. Not that God's going to kill you. So God's character is always saying Come to me. And so we, we go. You know, God, he came to Adam in the garden calling for him. Even after Adam had sinned, he called for him. You know, he lived amongst the Israelites in, in the desert in a tabernacle so that they could see a visible presence of God and seek after him. Because of man's sin, God had given a law that people were able to follow and be able to have access back to God because God is saying, come to me. Ultimately, God became flesh. He, Jesus came to the earth. He died for our sins and rose again so that God could say, come to me. It means that we can approach God with, with confidence because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Ephesians 2 says, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. And then again in Hebrews 4 it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. So as God says, come to me, we, we come, but we must come with reverence and we must come with fear knowing that at any moment the one who created you 
is sustaining every breath in your lungs. We have to have that presence, that mentality, that understanding of who God is. You know, casual hikers don't see like a a picture of Mount Everest and say, well, that looks like fun. Let me grab a couple water bottles, lace up my chucks really tight, and let's go have some fun. No, it, it takes years of intense, purposeful training to even attempt to climb this. They say you have to be in the peak physical, mental condition to be able to do this. Since about 1953, there's been about 4,000 people who have successfully reached, reached the top of Mount Everest. Roughly about 300 people have died doing it, and about half of those people are still at the top because it's too dangerous to pull them off, and it's too expensive. You know, the, the first person who, who climbed the mountain in 53, his name was Edmund Hillary, and uh, his partner was called, his name was Tenzing Norgay. They were the first people in 1953 to make it to the top of Mount Everest. Now, Edmund was an experienced mountaineer, but one thing he did say, he says, I've always hated the danger part of climbing, and it's great to come down again to be safe. The people who climb this mountain, the people who climb other tall peaks, they understand the dangers, they understand the risks that they're embarking on. So they approach these mountains, they approach the mountain with respect and fear, working within the framework of the mountain and how the weather permits. And I I think that's a, a good analogy for us, for how we are to approach God. We approach not flippantly, but with reverence and and with fear. Jesus said in John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. So there's a prescribed way in how we come to the Lord. We approach in the way he wants us to approach, working with him, working through him, not for our purposes, but to accomplish the will of God, to accomplish the things that he's doing in this world. We don't, we're not being hindered and burdened by the fears of this world. We stay focused on God. We stay in his fear. And so God continues in verse 14. It says, He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone and a stumbling rock of offense to both the house of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Verse 15 And many among them shall stumble, they shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. You know, on one hand, if we put our trust in him, he is our fear. And nothing else, um, on on one hand, if if we put our trust in him, if he is our fear and, and nothing else, then he will be our sanctuary. He will be our place of refuge in times of trouble. Proverbs 18 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And so he's saying he is our sanctuary, our place of refuge. But on the other hand, we've got those people who who do not trust the Lord and who do not properly fear him. They are left to their own devices, left to walk in this world of dread and terror alone. But I want to read that again. Um, It says that, God is a stone of stumbling. He is a rock of offense. In times of trouble, you know, people inevitably say, where is God in all of this? Why is this happening? But in Romans, it tells us that that people suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It says that although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
So what did we just read? God is saying right here that he is in their way. That he's, he's a stumbling block in front of people. And that sounds odd and that, that sounds harsh. But it also sounds like the heart of a father. A father who's standing in the way of their wayward child. Trying to block them from a terrible fate that they know is coming. God doesn't take pleasure in this. He doesn't delight in people's destruction. Second Peter 3 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some have count slackness, but he is long-suffering towards us. And read this, he says, Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's done all the work for us. He's done the work on the cross. He has sent us an invitation to come and sit at his table and have dinner with him. Some will accept that invitation, and some will not. And that's, that's, that's a hard thing to swallow. That's a hard fact to face, especially for some of us who have loved ones who don't know. But God's character, again, he will never force us to come to his table. Verse 16 says, Bind up the testimony, seal the law, among my disciples and I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him here am I the children here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me we are the signs and the wonders in Israel for the Lord of hosts who dwells in the Mount Zion so Isaiah here he he now turns to himself and to the people of God you know, right now he's, he's in a time of patience as they wait for the Lord's plans to, to come to fruition. And like Jesus said in Matthew 24, he says, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. God's purposes are being, taken, are being fulfilled. He's doing a work. These things have to come to pass. And so Isaiah is now in a, in a time of waiting God's will is being accomplished whether we understand it, whether we see his plan, whether we know what he's doing. But we have to faithfully and patiently wait for God's work to be done. But that that waiting is, is, it's a hard part, right? Psalm 42, it says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say, Where is your God? We long for God and we live for God and we desire his presence. Yet we endure the ridicule of this world saying, Where is your God? Peter says the same thing in 2 Peter 3. He says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So yes, the the waiting is hard, but what do we do in this time of waiting? Isaiah says that, that we're to be signs, to be wonders for the Lord of hosts. In 2 Thessalonians 2, He says, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of the lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That restrainer that he's talking about, that, that restrainer is the Holy Spirit. The one keeping absolute evil at bay. The Spirit of God that dwells within you and me. So what are we to be doing in this waiting? Well, if it says right here, it says we're supposed to be restraining. We're supposed to be holding back the evils of this world, being signs and wonders of who God is. So I encourage you guys, be, be bold, be truthful, but above all, just be loving. 
Some people, they'll be attracted to, to your boldness. They'll be attracted to the truth that you bring, to the honesty that you bring in this world of, of despair and darkness. And some people will turn away. Some people are going to be put off by the truth that you bring, by them facing the sins that they have. But your only job is to present God, to present him to the world. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. Glorify your God, not you, not your church, not your community, but glorify your God in heaven. So let's continue in verse 19. It says, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they, there is no light in them. You know, God's word is true. The veracity of Scripture has been tested for hundreds of years. Scripture is true, and Scripture confirms Scripture first and foremost. Proverbs 30 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. And then also in Psalm 19 it says, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. I know that sounds kind of like circular argument, but, but the purity of words, the purity of something cannot be tested by the impure. It can only show the impurities of the other things. So we test scripture with scripture. But even the structure of the Bible is impossible by professional standards. In the Bible, there's, they've counted roughly about more than 63,000 references, cross-references in the Bible. And that's not just within single books. That, I'm speaking about the entire scripture. And that's a feat that's very difficult for one author to do, let alone 66 different books written by 40 different authors over thousands of years. There what experts who don't want to believe, they'll say there's an appearance of creation in this. There's a, a, a appearance of design in this, but it can't be designed. We know it's designed by the creator. If the Bible did not have a creator and it was not designed, I don't know, it sure, sure looks like it to me. But we know that science genetics, technology, archaeology, all these things, they're all finding that the Bible is accurate. And so why would we go and seek anything else to, to confirm us, to give us comfort, to give us peace? We have it all right here. Acts 4, it says, There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Isaiah is saying to, to seek God. Don't go chasing after dead things, after things that aren't alive, things that, that can't provide answers to you. Comfort and peace can only come from God. Seek him. Jeremiah 29 says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. And then ultimately Isaiah says that if you are not about his word, if your first response in times of trouble is not to search for God, it's not to cling to his promises, not to pray without ceasing, not to go after him, he says, there is no light in you. you know, Johnny Cash said that, I've learned that there is no fence to sit on between heaven and hell. There is no sideline in this fight. We are here and we either have to be with him or we are against him. But we serve a God of redemption, a God of reconciliation. In the first chapter of this book, God lists all the terrible things that, that the Israelites were doing. But in verse 16, he says, Wash yourselves, 
Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. There's redemption for those who have turned away from God. And he's saying here, if you have turned your way, turn back, cleanse yourself. Come, let us talk together and work this through, work this out. Let's, let's be together. But then Isaiah finishes off this chapter. Uh, and he describes the life of, the, of those who have chosen to live in darkness, who have chosen to live without God. So in verse 22, or 21 to 22, it says, They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see the trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. You know, we are, we are made to, to worship God. We are made to serve God. And when you have rejected God's authority, when you have made yourself God, this is the result. And what a, what a sad finish to this life. You know, it's as this person goes with bald fist and he's rejecting God and he's cursing God and he's cursing his king as he looks up to the heavens realizing that he's not there because he doesn't believe in him he's he's not there and there's nothing to hope in up there and so he looks at the ground defeated understanding his fate he walks off into the darkness as I said before that is not the fate that God wants. God wills that, that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so I encourage you guys, know your God. Seek after your God. Understand him. Know his character. But ultimately, walk in this world with, with boldness, with, with the truth, because you have a God, the Lord of hosts, who is with you, who is guiding you and directing you with his strong hands. So seek after him, love him, and pray to him. Let's pray and finish up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord. We thank you for your word, for your instruction, for your love and your mercy, Lord, for your long suffering. Many of us have turned away from you in our early days, in our walks, Lord. And you have accepted us back with open arms, with open hands, saying, come to me. And so we thank you for that. We ask that you be with us tonight, be with us in our time of worship as we just sing songs to you, songs of praise and songs of glory of who you are, Lord. Reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.